Hey guys, it's Medicos is Perfect Status, where medicine makes perfect sense. Let's continue our physiology playlist. In last videos, we have talked about the action potential. Today, we'll talk about what happens when you give the neuron a sub-threshold stimulus. Talk about the local response and the factors that increase or decrease nerve excitability. With that said, now let's get started. Today's video is number 48 in my physiology playlist. Let's review my nuggets. Number one, why do you need action potential? Because it's life. Inside your body, the nerve impulse is unidirectional. The nerve impulse starts from the axon HELOC, not to be confused with the home equity line of credit. During rest or the polarized state, the inside of the membrane is more negative, but upon activation, aka reversal of polarity or depolarization, the inside of the membrane becomes more positive as sodium comes into the nerve. Local anesthetics will affect type C fibers before type B, before type A fibers. Hypoxia, however, affects type A fibers before the rest. So based on the susceptibility to hypoxia, A is the most susceptible. Susceptibility to local anesthetics, C is more susceptible. Chronaxia is the time needed by a current whose intensity is double the right base to excite the nerve. Nugget 9 is the most important nugget today. What are the forms of membrane potential? Well, during rest, it's the resting membrane potential. But upon stimulation, if you give me the robust, adequate threshold, I'll give you an action potential, which is amazing. Resting membrane, potassium is leaving. Upon depolarization, sodium is entering. During repolarization, you stop the sodium influx and you start potassium efflux. The resting membrane potential is when the inside of the membrane is more negative. During rest, the membrane is more permeable to potassium and it's leaving. The causes of the resting membrane potential, selective permeability and the sodium-potassium ATPase pump. Because after the action potential, you have a mess. You need to actually return it to the normal resting state and the pump will does that for you. If you want to learn more about the Nernest equation and the Goldman equation, check out my previous videos. As you know, if I have sodium problems, I get CNS problems. If I have problems with potassium, the calcium, I get cardiac problems. The glorious rule of fours for your serum electrolytes. Who's the hero of the polarized state? Potassium, efflux. This is the resting membrane potential. You start opening some sodium channels until you hit the threshold. That's the firing level. Boom, look at this, firing, baby. Making a spike. Who's responsible for this activation or depolarization? Sodium influx. Who's responsible for the repolarization? The closure of the sodium channels and opening potassium channels to cause potassium efflux. And then you overshoot. That's the hyperpolarization due to excessive potassium efflux because the potassium channels are slow at opening, slow at closing. Pause and review. What is the difference between this slow rising and the rapid uprising? Well, in the slow depolarization phase, you have opened just some of your sodium channels. But in the rapid one, you have opened all of the sodium channels. After the action potential is over, who will re-establish the gradient, the sodium-potassium pump, by pushing the sodium out and the potassium in? The all or none law was discussed before. What does that mean? It means that I either generate and conduct maximally or not at all. There is no sort of kind of ish. If you treat me with respect, threshold, I'll give you the action potential. But if you treat me with less respect, aka sub-threshold, I will treat you with less respect, aka a local response. Can I give you like half of the threshold and you give me an action potential? Oops, I cannot. Sorry, because I follow the all or none law. I either excite or no. It's either zero or one. That's it. The refractory period. What the flip is that? It's a period during which the nerve is refractory to stimulation. No duh. Why do you need it? To protect the nerve from extremely rapid repetitive stimulation that can destroy it. And it has two types. The absolute refractory period and the relative refractory period. The red rectangle here is the absolute refractory period. The membrane was at rest. And then you activated the membrane by giving it a threshold stimulus. Hey, can I give you another threshold stimulus and you give me another excitation? Oops, I'm, I can't because I am in an absolute refractory period. I will not give you a second action potential no matter how strong your stimulus is. And why is that? Because I've just closed my sodium channels and I cannot open them again due to inertia. You're gonna have to wait for some time, big boy. All of that we have discussed so far was about the action potential with a threshold stimulus. 
But what if the stimulus is not that strong? It is sub-threshold. I'll give you a local response. This is not an action potential. This is not what makes you see, hear, smell, think. No, no, no. The action potential is life. Local response is just some local response. It's uh, minuscule. It cannot propagate from the beginning of the axon to the end of the axon. So when you give me a sub-threshold stimulus, I cannot give you an action potential, but I can give you non-propagated potential, a potential that does not propagate throughout the nerve fiber from the axon helix to the axon terminalis. And these non-propagated potentials are divided into electrotonic potentials and the local response. This electrotonic potential is subdivided into cat electrotonus and an electrotonus. Let's go back to square one. Why did we call cations cations? Because these are ions that are attracted to the cathode. The cathode is negative, that's why it attracts the positive ions, okay? Why do we call anions anions? Because they are attracted to the anode. The anode is the positive pole, therefore it attracts the negative charges, anions. And that's why we have two types of electrotonus, cat electrotonus and an electrotonus. Where do you find cat electrotonus? Um, at the cathode, duh! And the an electrotonus is at the anode. What happens in cat electrotonus? Partial depolarization. What the flip? Why? I'll tell you because on the outside, the cathode is negative. But on the inside, there are positive ions. That's why they are attracted to the negative, because they are positive. So you'll have tons of positive on the inside. What does positive inside the nerve do? Oh, it causes depolarization. That's right. But it's not the strong, robust depolarization of the action potential. This is small, minuscule, partial depolarization of the freaking electrotonic potential. Sub-threshold, baby. Partial depolarization, meaning that you are becoming more positive. You are moving closer to the firing level, moving up, up, and up. And therefore, the threshold is being lowered. The excitability is increasing. And electrotonus is the exact opposite. The anode is positive. It attracts the negatives. When the inside surface becomes more negative, you are hyperpolarized. You're toast. You're not active. Your excitability is decreased. Threshold is higher. That's why it's harder for you to be excited. And you're moving away from the firing level, like a doofus. We're done with the electrotonic potentials, cat, electrotonus, and electrotonus. Let's talk about local response. Local response, what the flip is that? Uh, you, when you give me a sub-threshold stimulus, when you give me less respect, I will not give you an action potential. I'll give you a local response. Do you obey the all or none law? <laughs> no, I do not obey it, because I am the scum of the earth. Do you have an absolute refractory period? No, these are for respected people. I'm a doofus. Are you propagated? No, even taxi drivers hate me. Have you opened all of your sodium channels like the action potential? Ah, no, I did not. Now, this is a very important comparison. The action potential versus the local response. The respected versus the meek. Action potential is a state of complete depolarization, complete reversal of polarity, followed by repolarization. On the other hand, local response is a state of partial depolarization less respected, below the firing level, followed by rapid repolarization. Since you did not go up as much, you will go down very quickly. Tell me about the stimulus. Here it's a threshold, but there, huh, sub-threshold. Action potential is respected. It has a private limo, propagated from the axon helix to the axon terminalis. But the Luca response does not propagate. Even taxi drivers hate him. Action potential is a respected dude, and it obeys the all or none law. That's why it cannot be graded. The local response does not obey the law, therefore it can be graded. But what the flip is gradation? Well, gradation is when you increase the magnitude of the action potential in response to the increased intensity of the stimulus. As I give you a more robust stimulus, you give me a more robust magnitude and a more robust response. That's gradation. But the poor action potential could not be graded. Why not? Because it obeys the all or none law. Give me threshold, I'll give you action potential. Give me sub-threshold, I'll not give you anything. How about if I give you supra-threshold? I'm sorry, I'll still give you the same action potential. I cannot increase my magnitude just because you gave me a more intense stimulus. 
I cannot be graded. Does the action potential have an apps or effect repaired? Yes, it exists. However, the local response does not. Because the action potential has an apps or effect repeated, it cannot be summated. The local response, because it has no apps or effect repeated, it can be summated. What the flip is summation? Summation is when you increase the number of stimuli. Stimulus, 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 more, add more, add more stimuli, add more, add more, add more stimuli, and then you will increase the magnitude of the action potential. But here, since I've just closed my sodium channels, they have inertia because I'm in the absolute refractory period, I cannot open them back up, so you have to wait. Therefore, adding more stimuli does not increase the magnitude of the action potential. Oops, I've just made stupid mistakes here. This should not be action potential. This should be the magnitude of the local response. Sorry. So the action potential obeys the all or none law. Therefore, it cannot be graded. It has an absolute refractory period. Therefore, it cannot be summated. All of my sodium channels are open here, but in the local response, uh, not all of them are open. Anesthesia will block me, will destroy me. Case in point, lidocaine. The nerve excitability increases until it reaches the firing level, then there is the absolute refractory period followed by the relative refractory period. Contrast that with the local response, uh, its excitability keeps going up, 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 up as it moves towards the firing level. But the local response does not reach the firing level. So my great Egyptian professor had a great mnemonic here. The action potential has four A's. First A, it obeys the all or none law, therefore it cannot be graded. It has an absolute refractory period, therefore it cannot be summated. All of the sodium chains are open and anesthesia will block it and destroy it. Do you remember my video on the nernest potential? Yeah, we talked about this. If I have hypokalemia, what does that mean? Less potassium in the ECF. Therefore, I'll have more potassium in the ICF, relatively speaking. If you have more potassium in and less potassium out, you're making it easier for the potassium to leave creating a more steep gradient, leading to a more robust potassium efflux. When potassium leaves, you are in the resting membrane potential, the polarized state. Polarized, caused by potassium efflux. And when you are resting, by definition, you are not in action potential mode. You are not in depolarization mode. You are away from the threshold. So if the threshold is here, you are way down here. Conversely, if I have hyperkalemia, now I have tons of potassium outside. Oh, making it harder for the potassium to leave the cell. Decreasing potassium efflux, resting membrane potential is becoming more negative, and I'm moving in this direction. Therefore, there is increased depolarization and there is increased action potential, etc. What are the factors that affect nerve excitability? We have three factors. The role of sodium, the role of potassium, and the stinking pump. Let's start with potassium because you already know it. If I have hyperkalemia, this will decrease electromagnetic gradient, decrease potassium efflux, resting membrane potential becomes more positive, bringing the membrane closer to the threshold, increasing nerve excitability. This is what we have discussed just five seconds ago in the previous slide. Hypokalemia, decreased nerve excitability. And that's why, remember, kalium problems cause cardiac problems. Yep, your heart needs to be excited. If you mess with your heart's excitability, either way you can get arrhythmia. Hypokalemia, hyperkalemia, doesn't matter, you get arrhythmia. In the following slide, we'll talk about the treatment of hyperkalemia, but wait for me. Hold your horses. How about the role of sodium? Do you remember my mnemonic, calcium is contra-excitability? Yep, here is why. When you have low calcium in the extracellular fluid, oh, if calcium is low, excitability is high. That's right, doofus, but let me explain the mechanism. Okay. When calcium is low, you will decrease the threshold at which the voltage-gated sodium channels become activated. Think of the threshold as a bar that you have to jump over. As I lower the bar, it becomes easier for you to jump. Oh, increasing sodium permeability, which increases nerve excitability. Hashtag Olympics. And that's why tetany has carpopedal spasm. Tetany is hypocalcemia. Yeah. And what is spasm? Spasm is increased muscle contraction. You know why? Because you have increased nerve excitability and the nerve will talk to the muscle. 
See, medicine makes so much sense once you understand what the flip you're talking about. But when calcium is high, this will decrease nerve excitability. Why? Two reasons. First reason is here. When calcium is high, you will increase the threshold. You will raise the bar, making it more difficult for sodium to enter, lowering the excitability. Reason number two is calcium is a cation. Sodium is another freaking cation. Cations repel each other. Opposites attract, similars repel. Again, calcium is contra-excitability. If calcium is low, excitability is high. Calcium is high, excitability is low, and it has to do with the sodium. Sodium is the hero of depolarization or activation. That's why if sodium is low, the amplitude of the action potential is low. If sodium is high, the amplitude is high. Of course, the amplitude is the height of the spike. Last, the role of the sodium-potassium ATPase pump. Remember, after the party is over, this one will re-establish the gradient. Therefore, if you block it for a long time, you will decrease nerve excitability. Because if you do not return to the normal state, you cannot go to party again. These are your factors that increase the excitability. These are your factors that decrease the excitability. Anything that decreases the excitability is a membrane stabilizer. Hyperkalemia is evil because it can lead to arrhythmia. So how do you treat it? First order of business is to stabilize the membrane. I give calcium gluconate, calcium chloride, or calcium whatever to protect the heart, to stabilize the membrane of the cardiac myocyte. Because when you increase calcium, you decrease excitability. Hashtag membrane stabilizer. Medicine makes so much sense once you understand what the flip you're talking about. Ask your woke internal medicine doctor, why does calcium gluconate actually stabilize the membrane of the heart? Blank out. Next, you give insulin glucose to treat hyperkalemia. Why? Because insulin takes five things and just rams them into the cell. These five things are, number one, glucose. Why? Because I want to take you into the cell to make you into glycogen or to burn you to get energy. Number two, amino acids. Why? I want to take you into the cell to make you into proteins. Number three, free fatty acids. Insulin will take them into the cell. Why? Because I want you to stay in the cell and become bigger triglycerides, lipogenesis. Number four, potassium. I want you to go to the cell. And number five, phosphate. Insulin will take it into the cell. So insulin will take potassium into the cell. So if you have hyperkalemia, too much potassium in the blood, why don't you give insulin to take it to the cell? Yeah, that's great, but you have to give glucose. Why? I'm not trying to treat hypoglycemia. Doofus, pay attention. If you give insulin alone, yes, potassium will leave the blood and go to the cell. Amazing. But glucose will also leave the blood and go to the cell because insulin cannot help himself. This will lower the glucose in the blood, causing hypoglycemia. So you were trying to treat the patient's hyperkalemia and you ended up killing the patient from hypoglycemia. Well done, doctor. Well done. Third, you give diuretics. Any diuretic? Yep, any except the potassium sparing ones. Because the potassium sparing ones will spare potassium. They will cause hyperkalemia. No kidding. Next, you give a beta agonist. Why is this? Because beta agonists stimulate the sodium potassium ATPase. They are GS coupled. And when you stimulate the sodium potassium ATPase, you will push sodium to the outside, but you'll push potassium inside the cell. Potassium inside the cell, treating the hyperkalemia. Kyxalate is the poop lover. It binds potassium and makes you lose potassium in your poop. Potassium is lost in the poop. Potassium will not go to the blood. Hashtag treatment of hyperkalemia. When the poop hits the fan, go with dialysis. My hero, Dr. Thomas Sowell, had a very, very important segment called Random Thoughts in the Passing Scene. I loved it. So here are some random thoughts in the passing scene of physiology. You remember the old adage on how to boil a frog? Yeah, raise the temperature one degree at a time. If you raise the temperature suddenly, the frog is gonna jump. But when you raise it gradually, the frog will not notice. It is very sad. One doofus historian asked a guy in the Soviet Union a question. How did the Soviet Union manage to silence all of you? The answer was, they did it one person at a time, gradually. How do many people develop Cushing syndrome, acromegaly, hyperthyroidism, hypothyroidism, and they have change in facial features, change in their weight, change in their appearance, and they did not notice anything because it happens gradually. 
In Cushing, you are swelling one femtoliter every day. When you do it gradually, you will not notice. Such is the way of accommodation. Accommodation, baby. So if you give me a sudden stimulus, that's not accommodation. I'll give you a response. The response could be action potential if you give me a threshold or a local response if you give me a sub-threshold. But if you increase the intensity of the stimulus gradually, I will not respond. I will accommodate. This is the story of the frog. It's the story of the guy in the Soviet Union. What is the mechanism of accommodation? All right, when you gradually increase the stimulus intensity, you will slowly open the sodium channels and slow influx of sodium will take place. But you will have time to counteract it, to balance it out. How? Because the, as like some sodium channels are open. That's true. Some sodium channels are closed. Oh, we balance each other. Some sodium channels are opening, okay? Some potassium channels are opening. Sodium is entering, potassium is leaving. We balance each other out. There is no response hashtag accommodation. How does your nerve get energy? Oh, does the nerve need energy? Of course, doofus, because you need ATP. Oh, so you need ATP, energy. During rest, you need energy because what's the cause of the resting membrane potential? Selective permeability and the sodium potassium pump. During activity, you still need energy for the sodium potassium ATPase. And the greater the sodium influx, the greater the mess that you caused in the party, the harder the pump has to work to push the sodium out and to clean the mess after the party. And the pump is not cheap, it requires ATP, which is expensive. Therefore, you'll produce some heat. We have initial heat and recovery heat. Initial heat happens during the action potential, recovery heat happens after the party. Believe it or not, you will produce more heat after the party than during the party. You were having fun like a doofus, but your mother will suffer the next day. So at least say thank you, you freaking ungrateful piece of melon. Some pearls for the pros. When you increase calcium in the ECF, yeah, calcium is high, excitability is low. Anything that decreases excitability is a membrane stabilizer. So hypercalcemia is a membrane stabilizer but lithium is a mood stabilizer. Now we have three concepts. The first concept is called the end plate potential, and then we have excitatory postsynaptic potential, and then we have inhibitory postsynaptic potential. EPP and PSP are excitatory, IPSP is inhibitory. Let's review the neurotransmitters in your brain. Glutamate and aspartate are excitatory, GABA and glycine are inhibitory. If you love this video, you will adore my Utacoid pharmacology course available at medicosisperfectsnatis.com. I also have a cardiac pharmacology course and a CNS pharmacology course. Use promo code histamine to get a 40% discount available for the next 31 students only. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, hit the bell and click on the join button. You can support me here or here. Go to my website, download my courses, go to Picmonic for animated medical mnemonics. Thank you for watching. As always, be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis Perfect Snandless, where medicine makes perfect sense.